Well, good afternoon. Welcome to the session on low level and optimization. Uh, I'm Sing Bing Kang, um, and I'm co chairing this session with uh, Xia Liu. Um, so, a quick announcement as, as courtesy to all the speakers, if you need to leave the room, could you please do so quietly, please? Thank you. So, let's get started. Hi everyone, I'm Chao Liu from Carnegie Mellon University. Today I'm going to introduce our work on depth and uncertainty estimation from a video camera. This is a joint work with Jin Wei Gu, Ki Wan Kim, uh, Sin Rasa Narasimhan, and Ian Kautz. For a lot of applications, the depth sensing is necessary for the agent to get a better understanding of its surrounding to choose appropriate behavior. In this work, we focus on depth sensing using RGB video camera due to its high spatial resolution, low price, and portability. There are a lot of works on depth estimation from video camera. And recently, the deep learning based method have achieved state of art performance. However, depth estimation error is inevitable and can come from a lot of sources, such as occlusions on depth, depth boundaries low light conditions, and small camera baselines. For applications that are based on depth estimations, it is important to have a general confidence estimation in depth sensing. In our work, we aim to estimate the depth and its corresponding confidence using RGB video camera. Besides that, we want to accumulate the information over time to update confidence and achieve temporal consistency on depth estimations. To this end, we define the depth probability value as a set of depth probability distribution for all pixels. The probability value is always attached to a camera and updated as the camera travels along its trajectory. For the overlapping region, the confidence becomes higher while in the non-overlapping regions, we get lower confidence since less measurements are available there. We propose to update the depth probability volume in a Bayesian filter way. First, we predict the volume for the next frame without using the new image available. Then we update the volume using only the new images and combine that with the predictions. We implement the Bayesian filter within a deep learning framework. The framework consists of three stages. The local measurement stage, where images within a small time window around current frame are used to estimate the depth probability volume. The update stage, where the confidence is updated using prediction from the previous frames. And finally, the upsample stage, where the results are refined and upsampled to achieve higher spatial resolution. In the local measurement stage, we use a network to extract the image features and warp the features from source views to reference view to get the local estimation for the volume. In the update stage, the local depth probability volume is combined with a prediction and get updated. By accumulating the information over time, the estimated depth map becomes less noisy and the confidence increase faster and lasts longer at higher levels. In upsample stage, the updated depth probability volume is refined and upsampled to achieve higher spatial resolution. Compared with other methods, our method generates more accurate and temporally consistent results. The confidence becomes higher as the same region stays longer in the field of view. On the other hand, the depth boundaries always have lower confidence due to occlusions and disocclusions. Given the depth map sequence, we apply the voxel hashing algorithm on multiple estimated depth maps to reconstruct a 3D mesh for the scene. Our method can reconstruct a highly quality 3D mesh with much less misalignment artifacts. We also evaluate our method on outdoor RGB videos. We apply box hashing to reconstruct the 3D structure of the street from the estimated depth map sequence. Within the sequence shown here, the vehicle was moving in a straight line. The reconstruct street view from above 
compared with other methods, our uh, compare as other methods, our me uh, algorithm reconstructs the streets more faithfully. We evaluate our method by cross-state training and testing, and our method achieves state-of-art performance. Please to come to our poster for more results and details. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. I will, I'm from System Research. I will talk, up, talk about our work, DoubleNet Serial Deblurring with View Aggregation. Nowadays, stereo cameras are widely adopted in our life, such as smartphones, autonomous vehicles, intelligent robots, uh, self-driving cars, etc. However, they also suffer from dynamic sync blur to the camera shake, object motions, depth variations. It not only leads to visual discomfort, but also have an influence on further image processing. Previous works have succeeded in single image deep learning, especially end-to-end -end CM method has recently achieved encouraging results. However, this is fear when handling complicated uniform blur. On the other hand, to the best of our knowledge, and there are few studies on stereo deep learning, they are time consuming due to complex optimization process. Our motivation is based on two observations below. First, it can be seen in the green and the yellow boxes of the light figure. The closer pixels are more blurry than the distance ones. Uh, the equation A shows that the blur size does x uh, is inversely proportional to depth C if motion of object delta P is fixed. We call it depth varying blur, which means that the close objects tend to generate larger blur. As a, res as a result, depth information can be helpful for deblurring. Secondly, from green boxes, we find two view generate different blur due to relative motion and rotation between objects and camera. And it can be seen from the equations B and C, we, can, we call it view varying blur. The network can benefit from an adaptive fusion scheme where the sharp pixels can be transformed and selected to restore clear image from a blurry one. When generating our data set, we captured serial videos using the camera and we increased the frame rate to 480 FPS using a frame interpolation. Then we accumulated the successive images to stimulate the blurry ones, and the ground truth sharp images are the middle frame. We generate about 70,000 images pairs for training and 3,000 pairs for testing. Our dataset is publicly available. Uh, with the proposed data set, we train a CM model. It con 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 consists of three sub-networks, DeepLearnNet, DeepMarnet, and FusionNet. The depth information from DeepMarnet and the two-view information from DeepLearnNet are integrated by FusionNet. This is a detailed structure of DeepLearnNet and DeepMarnet. We obtain the multi-scale features, uh, and we use a context module in these two networks. The module contains parallel dilated convolutions with different dilated rates. In FusionNet, there are two paths. The gated net provides a gate, gate, gate map to aggregate two view features adaptively, and the deep aware net is adopted to transfer the depth information from this net. So depth and two view information are embedded in these output features of FusionNet. To train our model, we consider MSC loss and the perceptual loss for deep blurring and the mass scale MSC loss for disparate estimation. Here are the experimental results. We, we evaluate our DeepLearnNet and uh, the proposed DoubleNet on our proposed data set, and also evaluate the DeepLearnNet on GoPro data set. This shows the improvements in terms of PSNR and SSM, and in addition, um, our method also has smaller model size and uh, run faster. Uh, this is the visual result. Uh, we can see from the green boxes, our method can remove large blurs and restore sharp details. Uh, from this example, our method can restore uh, the words and the numbers on the fast-moving car. 
Uh, in this work, we present a large-scale stereo, bl stereo blurry image data set, and we also propose an efficient and effective end-to-end -end network for stereo image deblurring with depth awareness and view aggregation. And um, our method performs favorably against the stereo five method. Oh, thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Guo Lu from Shanghai Jiao Tong University. Today, I will introduce our recent work on learning-based video compression. This is joint work with Wan Li Ouyang Dongxu from the University of Sydney and Xiaoyun Zhang, Chen Lei Cai, and Zhi Yunggao from Shanghai Jiao Tong University. As we know that uh, the video data contribute to more than 80% internet traffic, and the percentage is still increasing. The video compression algorithm is utilized to reduce the storage size and the bandwidth of the video. In the past decades, a lot of video compression system has been proposed. For example, the video that we are using to give this presentation is encoded based on A264. The traditional video compression algorithm relies on classical prediction transform architecture and the handcraft technique to reduce the temporal and the spatial redundancy. In, uh, in addition, the deep learning techniques has been widely used to a lot of vision tasks due to its powerful representation ability. So the idea of our people is very straightforward. We want to combine the deep learning techniques and the traditional video compression architecture. So there are already some related work on learning-based image compression. These methods use CNN or RNN to build auto-encoder auto to compress the image. However, these methods cannot be utilized to reduce the temporal redundancy. In ECC uh, 18, the Chao Yuan proposed to formulate the video compression as a frame interpolation, but this method is not fully end-to-end -end optimized. Before I introduce our deep video compression model, I will review the classical video compression architecture. There are usually two steps for video compression system. For the prediction step, Block-based motion estimation is performed to estimate the motion between previous frame and the current frame. Then the motion composition is used to align the previous frame based on the estimated motion vector. After that, we can get the predict frame and the corresponding prediction residue. In the transform step, the linear transform converts the prediction residue to a more compact domain, which is easier for compression. In most video compression systems, the DCT transform is utilized. Then the quantization and the inverse transform are performed to get the reconstructed frame. Okay, this is the overall architecture of the classical video compression system. So, our framework combines the advantage of this classical video compression architecture and the powerful nonlinear ability from the neural network and I propose an end-to-end -end optimized video compression system. To the best of our knowledge, this is the first end-to-end -end optimized video compression system. Specific, specifically, we use the optical flow network to estimate the motion between two neighboring frames, and then the motion will be compressed by a well-designed motion, comp motion compression network. After that, we, the reconstruct optical flow is used to, uh, used to warp the previous frame. We also propose a motion composition network to refine the work the frame. Then from the prediction residual, an existing image compression system is utilized to uh, compress the residual information. Uh, our whole model is optimized based on a single loss function to balance the trade-off between distortion and the read term. It is obvious that, that there's a one-to-one -one mapping between the deep model and the classical architecture. So it's possible to further improve our deep model by uh, employing some uh, latest optical flow network or image compression system. We have performed extensive experiment on uh, about our model. In the evolution study part, we investigated the motion composition network, the motion compression network, motion information, the jump training scheme, and the online updating scheme. Each scheme or modular can improve the performance. 
we also compare our model with uh, state-of-art methods. Uh, our model out of form the widely used H264 algorithm in terms of both PSR and multi-scale SSSM. For example, our method saves more than 20% bit rate uh, when achieved the same PSR as H264. In addition, our method also has a high compression efficiency uh, when compared with the latest H264 standard and saves 10% bit rate in terms of multi-scale SSM. So welcome to our poster at uh, 149. Okay. Thanks for your time. Thank you. Are there any questions? Um, there, yes. Hi. Uh, question for the last talk on video compression. How does your technique compare to H.264 in terms of speed and energy use? Sorry? How does your technique compare to H.264 in terms of speed? Okay. Um, we use the... Uh, to report the result on H264, we use a uh, practical uh, video codec X264. And uh, we also use X265 to report the result on HEVC, uh, I mean H264. I'm, I'm confused. How slow is your technique compared to how slow H264 is? How slow? How, how fast does it run? OK. Sorry. Uh, uh, the encoding speed, uh, encoding speed of our method is about uh, 24 FPS when the uh, input image is about, uh, with the resolution of uh, 400 by 200. Do you know how fast H.264 is? Uh, for the, uh, the H, uh, X.264 is much faster than ours because they are highly optimized to utilize the multi-core system. Do you think it's possible to optimize your system to be competitive with H.264? Uh, Do you think you can make yours as fast as H.264? I uh, don't think so. OK. So one question regarding the first talk. Um, you showed some results on, on your confidence. There were some very periodic um, uh, confidences. Can you maybe comment how they uh, how they are produced? Yeah. So uh, that's actually the aliens artifact, and because because we are using a sweeping plan representation for depth probability volume, so we can remove that part that uh, aliens artifact by either increase the sampling rate or just do, use a, a, a post processing to fit uh, to fit the model along each uh, pixel. For example, a Gaussian mixture model to get uh, the sigmas and. Uh, uh, the uh, mean values, and uh, we show some results in our poster without the artifacts using this uh, technique. Any other questions? Uh, for the last speaker, did you compare it, uh, did you compare with HM or FFmpeg? Last speaker. Can you speak, uh, can you speak again? HM? Uh, yeah. Pardon? Sorry, uh, can you speak again? So f when you compared it with HEVC, did you use HM uh, code no, we or use, uh, F FMPEG? Uh, we use the FMPEG with uh, X264. Okay. Okay, thank you. Great. Let's thank the speakers once more. Hello everyone, my name is Yu Tian, and uh, today I'd like to present our work, SOS Night, which is a CNN-based method for local discriminant learning. And uh, this work was conducted while I was interning at Scape Technologies. Well, here we give an example of matching two images from different waypoints. And to match them, firstly, key points need to be detected. And then local patches are extracted around these key points. And finally, these local patches are encoded into discriminators and matched. This is the matching result given by SIP discriminator, and we can see that not all key points can be correctly matched. And to get better results, we can work on the repeatability of the detector or the robustness of the discriminator. And in this work, we focus on learning better discriminators. Yeah, our solution for better discriminators uh, is to provide better supervision in training and uh, different from previous works which optimize only the first order similarity, uh, we propose to also optimize the second order similarity.
And for the optimization of the first order similarity, we propose a quadratic in trivial loss, and we use the hard sample mining. And uh, the proposed QHD can weigh the gradients by the magnitude of the loss. For the optimization of the second order similarity, uh, we follow the intuition that matching discriminators should also have high second order similarity. And that we optimize second order similarity by optimizing the distance between distances. To illustrate, the second order similarity of x and x plus can be measured by the distance between y and y plus, where y and y plus are composed by distances of x and x plus to other reference points. Well, in the experiments, we found that uh, the selection of reference points are very crucial to the performance, and the discriminators that are very far away are not suitable for being as a reference. Therefore, we propose a Kamenin search strategy for the selection of reference. And in, in training, we set K to be eight. And uh, from the formulation of our SOS, we can see that it only imposes constraint on matching discriminators. Therefore, it is only a regular addition term and uh, cannot be used solely in training. And uh, we adopt the network architecture of L2 Knight, and uh, the network is traded with uh, Adam Optimizer. Uh, SOS Knight achieves state-of-the-art performance on several standard benchmarks evaluating local discriminators. And we have tested on tasks including patch verification, patch matching, patch retrieval, and uh, 3D reconstruction. To investigate why SOS Knight has superior performance, uh, we propose a evaluation protocol based on the Wombis Fisher distribution. And uh, a VMS distribution is for modeling the statistic properties of random points on a unit half sphere. And we consider it helpful because current state of the art local discriminators are all unit vectors. The mean direction mu and the concentration parameter kappa in a VMF distribution are just analogous to the mean and variance in the a Gaussian distribution. And this figure illustrates that a low kappa indicates a scatter distribution, while a, a high kappa indicates a concentrated distribution. And uh, ideally, we want uh, the cluster centers to be scattered and uh, all elements within the cluster to be concentrated. And therefore, we propose to use the ratio between the interclass kappa and the intraclass kappa as a performance indicator of the discriminators. And, uh, Better discriminators should have a lower ratio, and uh, we use the mean resultant lens R as a proxy for kappa. By using this new evaluation protocol, we interestingly found that the classic sieve discriminator tends to gather together in a small region of the hypersphere. This means sieved are very invariant but not discriminative enough, and also better discriminators always exploit the hypersphere better. And we hope our observation can inspire researchers in designing more powerful discriminators. And also, finally, our proposed SOS regularization is not just limited to local discriminator learning. It might be beneficial in other metric learning tasks. Thank you for your attention. Please uh, visit our poster at 150. Thank you. Hi everyone, my name is Yossi Gandelsman and I will present Double Dip. Uh, it's a joint work with Asaf Shoher and Michal Irani. We propose a unified framework for layer decomposition. What do I mean by that? Well, there's a lot of computer vision problems we're interested in. For example, taking an image and segment, segment, segmenting it to foreground and background layer. Or taking a hazy image and generating a hazy version of it. Or taking an image with reflections and separating it into two transparent layers. All of those seemingly different problems can be put under a single umbrella and formulated as the same problem of layer decomposition. How? Well, in all of these cases, an image can be regarded as the sum of two layers. Where the only difference is by the way those two layers are combined. In the case of image segmentation, it is the foreground layer and the background layer combined with a segmentation mask. In the case of transparency separation, the two layers are combined with a mixing coefficient, a scalar. And in the case of image dehazing, it is the haze-free image and the fog layer combined with a transmission map, which is inversely proportional to the depth of the scene. 
we show how all of these tasks can be solved in totally unsupervised way, with no prior examples whatsoever, trained only on the test image. Our work is inspired by Deep Image Prior by Juliano Vital. Given an input image, they propose to train a CNN to reconstruct this image from a random input noise. Eventually, this network will learn the image. But when it does so, the weights of the network will form a deep prior for this specific image. We call it deep. Why is this interesting? Well, for example, if you give it a noisy image, yes, eventually the network will learn the image. But somewhere along the way, in an intermediate iteration, it will produce a clean version of it. Uliano et al. showed how this can be used for a variety of inversion problems. But why it is easier for the network to produce a clean image over the noisy one? We attribute it to the fact that in the clean image, there is lower patch entropy than in the noisy image. There is a lot of patch repetition inside a single natural image. It is easy for a fully convolutional network to produce similar patches across the image. But in the noisy image, those patches are no longer similar, making it more difficult to the network to produce them. Using this observation, we propose double dip for unsupervised layer decomposition. Given a mixed input, we train two dips so that their sum will reconstruct the given input. Eventually, this network will learn the image, but interestingly, when it does so, it tends to split the image into two coherent layers. It happens because this is the easiest solution. Each dip learns the simplest distribution of patches. To further encourage it, we add an exclusion loss that makes the two layers uncorrelated, and this forms the two recovered layers of our algorithm. Here, we use the simple sum, but more often we want to combine the images with a more complex mask, which is also learned by our algorithm. The only difference between the tasks is by the loss imposed on this mask. For example, in the case of image segmentation, the loss will encourage the mask to be binary. Eventually, when the network will learn the image, here is the segmentation mask, and here are the two recovered layers. And you can see that one deep learned the zebra patches, while the other learned the grass patches. So let's see some results. Apparently, double deep is good for a variety of applications. For example, image segmentation. Here are the input images, and here are the segmentation masks. Although it's not a semantic segmentation, it does things that are far from being trivial. It groups the, the two ladies with their cards in a single layer. It segments, it segments the, three, uh, the three soldiers. It separates the two textures. And it happens because this is the easiest decomposition into two layers of patches. We applied it also for image dehazing. Here are the input images. Here are the as free images. And here are the masks, the transmission maps in this case, recovering information about the depth of the scene. We applied it also for transparency separation, given an input image, separating it into two transparent layers. And similarly for watermark removal. And I want to remind you that all of these tasks are solved in totally unsupervised way, with no prior examples whatsoever. To learn more, please come to our poster number 151. Thank you. Hi, my name is Tim Brooks, and on behalf of my collaborators at Google and UC Berkeley, I will talk today about our work on unprocessing images for learned raw denoising. Image denoising is a heavily studied topic, so let's take a look at some recent results, which are evaluated on synthetic data by adding Gaussian noise to images. I've plotted these to show progress in the research community over recent years. The y-axis is PSNR, where higher is better, and the x-axis is the year of publication. Overall, we see that the accuracy tends to improve with time, which is good. The research community is developing better algorithms for this task. However, remember that these results are on synthetic data, which is common practice for image denoising. Recently, some benchmarks have used real pairs of noisy and clean photographs. Again, the x-axis is the year of publication. 
Perhaps surprisingly, here the best performing technique was BM3D, which is 12 years old and uses no learning. More recent techniques, which rely more heavily on learning, perform worse on this task. So what's happening? Why are newer techniques not better? We saw in the first graph that progress is being made on synthetic data, which leads us to believe that there is some discrepancy between synthetic and real data. If we look at the visual differences, we can better understand that discrepancy. On the left is a generic sRGB image, similar to those commonly used as the source for training data. On the right is raw sensor data, which looks very different and has a Bayer color pattern. Additive Gaussian noise is often used in synthetic training data. However, real raw data has signal-dependent photon noise. While data sets of real noisy and clean photographs are accurate, they have many downsides. They're time consuming to capture, they only work for cameras in the data set, and they can't be used to image moving subjects. Synthetic data has none of those downsides, but has been systematically inaccurate, and past results show that this inaccuracy really matters. This paper is about finding the best of both worlds by unprocessing synthetic data to have the same statistical properties as real data. We do this by running an image processing pipeline in reverse. An image processing pipeline is a sequence of algorithms applied to raw sensor data to produce a normal looking image. The first steps are to denoise and demosaic the raw data. Demosaicing removes the Bayer color pattern in order to introduce red, green, and blue values at each pixel. Next, we apply white balance and a color correction matrix. Gamma compression more efficiently stores colors in a way that leverages human visual perception. And tone mapping preserves local contrast while compressing the image's dynamic range, giving us a normal looking sRGB image. In practice, there are many more algorithms applied during an image processing pipeline, but these cover some of the most essential steps. To generate more realistic synthetic data, we introduced the idea of unprocessing images or running the pipeline in reverse. In actuality, some steps cannot truly be reversed, so this is just an approximation. By unprocessing normal sRGB images, we can leverage the vast numbers of internet photos as training data to match raw data from any camera sensor. From the synthetic raw image, we extract the individual Bayer color channels and then add realistic photon noise. We train a neural network with a simple UNET architecture. Inputs are the noisy channels as well as the noise level, and the output is the residual noise. Our model significantly outperforms the state of the art on the Darmstadt noise dataset, which evaluates denoising on real photos. Note that the x axis is runtime and log scale, and that our model is about 10 times faster. Here's our model without unprocessing the training data, which does much worse. The performance drop isn't made up for by just making our model bigger. Here we quadruple the size of our network, and the results are still much worse than when the training data is unprocessed. Here are some key takeaways. Firstly, it's important to use realistic training data for denoising. Unprocessing images generates realistic data in a scalable and inexpensive way. These ideas are likely beneficial for similar tasks, and our code is open sourced and available for anyone who would like to use it. Lastly, here's a full screen result of our denoising. Please visit our poster and project website for more information. Thank you. There's some time for questions. Hello, I have a question for the last author. Uh, have you ever tried to directly add the noise to the raw image? Because nowadays there are thousands of uh, raw images in the internet. Do you have tried that? Um, I'm sorry, could you repeat that? I had trouble understanding. Have you ever tried to directly add the noise to the raw image? Directly adding noise to the raw image? Yeah, to the real noise mm -hmm. image. Yes, so, so that can also be done. You can add noise directly to the raw images. The difficulty there is that raw images already have noise, and it's difficult to get all of that noise removed. Um, so this could be done, and one other difficulty of this is that we want to make sure that it can match many different cameras, and different cameras have, like, capture light in slightly different ways. They might have different properties. So if you 
only use a data set of really high quality raw photos without noise from one camera, you need to capture it for all these different cameras. But by doing the unprocessing strategy, we can create synthetic raw images from any type of different sensor. But if you have clean image in the JPEG version, you can also create the uh, clean image in the raw version. Yes, so you certainly could start from raw data and then create different images from that raw data. We preferred to use sRGB images because they're much more easily available and then we have lots more variety and diversity in our data set. Thank you. Uh, so I have two questions for Yusuf. Um, so one is if the image has many layers instead of just two layers, uh, what would the result be? A second uh, question is uh, if the two network just outputs the same um, image, uh, how do you overcome that? Okay, so, so we didn't try it for more than two layers. I think that it can be extended to more, mo mostly for segmentation tasks, but also for, I don't know, uh, reflections and so on. Uh, can you repeat the second question, please? So the two networks, is there any regularization ma that makes sure that these two networks will output to different layers instead of like the same um, kind of mixed uh, layer? Yeah, so th this is uh, due to the fact that each layer uh, at the beginning has its own distribution. So, and w this is basically the idea that each, each uh, deep tends to learn the simplest distribution. And this is somehow the, the simplest distribution in this case. So. Okay. Um, do we have time for third one? Okay. All right. Let's thank the speakers again. Hello everyone, my name is Shou Zhang and I will present our work about residual networks for net, light field image super resolution. Light field images can be mathematically represented using four dimensional coordinates. Two of them represent the spatial domain and the rest two represent the angular domain. In the beginning, light field is captured using camera array. As it is too large and expensive, the handhold from an optic camera like Lytra is designed to capture light field in one shot. However, this kind of images has much lower spatial resolutions than traditional images. As light field images, uh, as well images in light field are highly corresponded, we propose to learn the subpixel mapping from, uh, between different views to increase the spatial resolution. In this figure, we use the stars to represent the pixel positions of the reference view. The triangles indicate the pixel positions of surrounding views. As view changes in one direction, for example, horizontally, they provide the subpixel information for the reference view in the horizontal direction too. This is our network structure. The view images are grouped into four sticks according to their directions and are fed into four branches. After extracting subpixel information in each direction, the features are simply concatenated to further learn the residual information between high and, and, and low resolution images. We then use one up sample night to obtain the final images. As light field contain multiple views, the next problem is how to super resolve all view images in one light field, especially with those who, uh, the, with those with the smaller angular resolution. Here we propose a simple and a flexible solution. As the designed network only increases the resolution of the central view, we divide one light field into different parts. Each view can be treated as the central view in the corresponding part. We train different networks for light field with different number of views input, and uh, these networks can be combined to obtain final results. We evaluate these networks using our test data site, as showing using the proposed structure, light field with three by three views can also achieve great, great results after training. In the experiment, both synthetic and real world lateral image are used to training and testing. Different light field and the single image super resolution methods are compared. We first evaluate the synthetic image results. The minimum average and the maximum PSNR and SIM of all views in one light field is calculated and compared. 
Results from depth-based method varied greatly in different wheel images. In our method, the difference in super-resolved wheel images are small in one light field. Next, we show some pic pictures. The textures are recovered accurately in both flight and occlusion regions using our method. We, we also compare the epipolar plan image of the super-resolved light field, where the line represents the depth information. Some lines in other methods are distorted since they do not consider the corresponding relationship between different views. Our method uses surrounding views to keep the epipolar property so that the depth information in EPI can well be preserved. Next, we evaluate our network with other kinds of images. As shown, the proposed method achieves significantly higher results in different kinds of images. The next figure shows uh, real-world images captured by Lytra. As shown, real images contain noticeable artifacts and noises, which make it more difficult to reconstruct. As shown, our method is able to recover the same structures, both in real image and the epipolar plan image. The others are showing uh, line, a line the results with indistinct lines. We also train a set of four times networks. In this task, it's difficult for the single image super resolution to recover accurate details. Therefore, the performance of EDSR decreased sharply, showing ambitious details. We combine information from four different directions and are able to recover the complex texture very well. Our code has been released, and please come to the poster session if you have no, any questions. Thank you for your attention. Um, good afternoon, everyone. I'm Jin Wenhe. Let me introduce our work, Modulating Image Restoration with Continuum Levels with Adaptive Feature Modification Layers. The first part is motivation. Uh, the degradation levels of real-world images are continuous, but the deep restoration models are trained with discrete levels. So the middle image with JPEG quality 30, applying a quality 80 model will output over-sharpening results, as you can see from the left, uh, while a quality 10 model will output over-smooth results, as you can see from the right one. Moreover, we always need a toolbar to modulate the restoration strength in human interactive softwares. So, how about training a large model to handle all degradation levels? However, this approach has some drawbacks. Uh, first, it requires expensive computational burden. Then, this trained model cannot be modulated to control the restoration effects. Therefore, we proposed an adaptive layer. Uh, it only requires few additional parameters, and uh, it allows continued tuning of parameters in testing. Then, then is our observation. If, if we fine tune the whole network from noise level 15 to 50, just from the left to the right, as two groups of filters look very similar at visual patterns, but different at statistics, while the cosine distance between these two filters is 0.12. In fact, we can use a filter to bridge two corresponding filters, and the bridge filter G of size five times five is in the middle. Another observation is that if we modulate G by coefficient lambda, the final image effect could change continuously, as you can see from the soldier image. Here is the adaptive feature modification layer. Actually, it's, it is equal to a channel-wise convolutional layer, and it's located after convolutional layers. Moreover, the future size can be one times one, three times three, and five times five, etc. In fact, the adaptive layer is related to batch normalization. So when the future size is one times one, the feature modification equals to normalization, but without batch information. Then how to use the adaptive layer? Here comes the model training part. For step one, we train the basic model for start level. Next, we insert atom layers to the basic model. Then we only optimize the parameters of atom layers on the end level. So to handle all the middle restoration levels, we linearly interpolate all the parameters of atom layers, which is 
to adjust the coefficient lambda. This process is called uh, modulation testing. So um, here is the experiment. The atom layers only contain less than 4% of total parameters in the basic model, and we want to figure out, uh, firstly, can atom layers achieve good adaptation performance, and how to choose the field size, and the direction, and the range. Finally, um, how to modulate it to the desired level. We find that larger field size, larger field size achieves better performance, as is, and, and it's very close to the baseline. And from easy to hard is better than from hard to easy. For example, uh, from JPEG quantity 80 to 10 is better than from 10 to 80. And the smaller range obtains better adaptation results. For example, in super resolution times three to times four is better than two times five. Finally, we try to evaluate the modulation testing precise. From quantity 80 to 40, we can find the best interpolation coefficient lambda for all the middle levels. And the curve fitting, see the origin line, it turns out to be a straight line from the start to the end. But if we enlarge the range, say from quantity 80 to 10, this fitting curve, which is a blue line, can be modeled as a cubic function. Note that the fitting error is less than 2.2 dB. There are some demos about the modulation. Uh, this is the DigiPeg. And next, we we'll show the denoising. You can see the image gradually becomes oversmoothed, but we can slide it back to obtain the best restoration result. Our work is mainly for image restoration. We have another work also related to modulation, accepted by CVPR this year, which is a deep network interpolation. So, well, I'll call you. Welcome to my post number 154 to have discussions with me. Thanks very much. Hello, everyone. This was Dan from Tsinghua and Hong Kong Polytechnic University. This is the outline of the presentation. The goal of the image simulation is to restore high resolution images from its low resolution counterparts while estimating high frequency emissions that is lost uh, in the low re resolution images. It is uh, severely uh, inverts our problems, and so the method should explore the contextual information. Recently, there are many deep, there are many deep learning based methods have been designed for a single image super resolution and achieve remarkable success. However, among these methods, most of them focus on the uh, design the deeper and the wider CM models for better feature expressions, while rarely works focus on exploring feature correlations, which is also important for the feature expression of the network. In this work, we focus on uh, exploring the such feature correlations. In fact, there exists some works using feature correlations for high-level tasks, such as image and video classification. They are usually called attention-based methods in computer vision community. It can be roughly divided into two types, special attention and channel attention. Special attention methods usually explore feature correlations in special dimensions within features. Typical methods like self-attention or non-local neural network. Instead, channel attention methods usually explore the channel-wise correlations across channels. Typical methods like SENet later done and introduced the SENet uh, to CM based model for super resolution. Motivated by the above observation, we can know special and channel attention individually help to improve the feature expressions. And uh, second, and the most existing CM based methods only explore the first order information uh, a feature, like use the average pooling. In addition, some work shows second order status further improves the discriminative of the ability of the network. So we claim that combining the special and channel attentions may be helpful and utilizing the second order statics may be more helpful for the single image super resolution task. And this is the main contribution of our work. First, we propose a second order attention method for the better feature expressions based on the sec uh, special and channel attention. And we used a uh, proposed uh, non-local uh, non enhanced resident group to build a uh, deep network. And we proposed the second order channel attention module based on the feature statics, higher than first order information. This is the architecture of our uh, work. Their component, uh, it consists of different parts.
And uh, to use the uh, special fe uh, feature spectral correlation, we propose the region level non, non local module at the local neighborhood for the fast speed. And uh, to use the uh, second order stat uh, feature statics, we first reshape the feature of uh, H times W uh, times C to feature of H W times C. And then we can compute the sample covariance matrix. As previous study also shows, matrix power normalization plays a critical role for the covariance pooling. Since covariance matrix uh, sigma is symmetry positive semi-definite, Thus, uh, we can have the agent value decom decomposition. However, agent value decomposition um, is not well supported on the existing GPU platform. So to solve this problem, uh, the combination of the agent, agent value decomposition can be uh, instead computed by the uh, new, new term shorts iteration in matrix multiplication. At last, we perform the global covariance pooling and obtain the repetition of the features as the input of our second order pooling to learn the weight vectors. This is application study shows our uh, effects of our uh, different models, different components in our model. We also provide the test results on major civil region uh, benchmark data sets. We can see that our methods and, and uh, um, our master plus, which is a self ensemble version of our model, we most of the existing CM based models under the uh, commonly by QB degradation and the uh, blood down the degradations. And uh, we also provide uh, some of the visual results. As you can see in the pictures, and we can see our methods we can re reconstruct the structural images well and uh, can recover more details and then the existing methods. So to conclude, we propose a second order attention method to improve the feature expressions of learned work. So for your, uh, please go to our uh, post session. Thank you for listening. Are there any questions for the speakers? Okay, so um, for the uh, image super resolution, you're, you're assuming that the camera grid is regular. What happens if the camera grid is less regular? What do you do? You mean the, the camera array? Correct. Um, I don't ever try this because the light field is uh, assumed to be regular. <coughs> Okay, but what if it's not exactly regular? Uh, I think we can cal uh, calibrate it first. Speak louder. Oh, uh, I think we can calibrate this uh, camera's array first to make it regular. Um, okay. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> so, so for the second paper, um, the the adaptation is one-dimensional. Yeah, one dimension. Right. So what if it's more than one dimension? How would you change your architecture? Say two dimension instead of one. Okay. You have to... Uh, instead of, say, say for example, you know, you want contrast enhancement changes and noise suppression changes. It's basically a two dimensional change. Yeah, it's a very nice idea. And uh, I will do it um, in our future work. Oh, thanks very much. Um, okay. okay, thank you. <laughs> um, so, um, it's very nice work. I'm just kind of wondering, um, what are the failure modes for your architecture? What? Failure modes. Uh, when does it fail? Does it fail? Or does it uh, let's write. Uh, in our experiments, we find uh, the second order statics uh, maybe is more suitable for the images that are um, contain more uh, higher order, second order statics maybe use the, uh, maybe the, the image with the more texture, uh, with the texture information. Maybe for some the, uh, the image with the, maybe the first order, maybe we, it contains the uh, most important like the address, it is the uh, first order, maybe it's not very well than the existing method. So we are method is more suitable for the images with the more texture images, just the second order statics. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Well, let, let's thank the speakers once more. Hello, 
everyone. My name is David Acuna. I'm going to present our work, Devil is in the Ages, Learning Semantic Boundaries from Noisy Annotation. This is a joint work with Anne Lansanja at the NVIDIA Toronto Lab. We all know that boundaries are extremely important and a core component of several computer vision tasks. For example, object boundaries are essential for robotics applications such as object grasping or autonomous driving. Moreover, some objects are in fact curves. Examples of this include roads in satellite images and vessels in the medical domain. Boundaries has also been exploited in recent image synthesis work. In addition to this, boundary information can help us to improve the quality of segmentation data sets or to perform interactive annotation. However, current method has several problems. In this example, we can see many false positives. We can also see that the predictive boundaries are also quite thick. So how can we make this detector sharper and more precise? We believe that one of the main problems is due to the difficulty arising during the labeling process. In other words, if your model never sees accurately annotated boundaries during training, then it's very hard for it to make accurate predictions at test time. Here we show two annotated examples from a very popular data set. We can see that these annotations are quite imprecise. However, the annotating to perfection will take a considerable amount of time, and it will be very challenging due to the nature of this task. In this framework, in this work, we then present STL. STL is a framework to learn semantic boundaries from noise annotations. Our framework constitutes of two main components. Firstly, we iterate between learning a boundary network and a refinement state with a level set formulation. Notice that we are inferring real ground truth from noisy data, and that this is happening during training. Therefore, as shown in the example, the ground truth is evolving. Secondly, we propose a new regularization loss. This enforces a maximal response along the normal direction of the predictive boundary. And during training, these two works together. Our framework is general, and it doesn't rely on any network architecture, so it can be added in a plug and play fashion to any existing backbone. Here, we use CaseNet. We can see that the predictions obtained by our approach are sharper, and many of the false positives are removed. The predictions are also optimized for post-processing due to the new regularizer. We tested our method on the SBD dataset. And here we show qualitative example. Notice the sharpness of the edges. Here, we showcase the performance of STL. On this data set, we further tested the performance of our method in a re-annotated test set. We can see that in both cases, we achieve a state of the art. We also evaluated the STL on the challenging cityscape data set. Notice that our method significantly outperformed previous state of the art baselines. One could also wonder, what about those boundaries that can be obtained from a semantic segmentation network such as DeepLab? In the plot below, we compare our boundaries versus DeepLab boundaries. We can see that in spite of using a much simpler architecture, our method performs significantly better, even at the strictest regime. Finally, we show how to use STL to efficiently annotate segmentation datasets. In particular, we use STL to refine the cityscape's coarsely annotated training subset. This simulates the scenario where the annotator is quickly drawing coarse mass and is using our method to improve the quality of the labeling. We can see that our method significantly improves the quality of the annotated labels. And to quantify this, we use our refined data set to train a semantic segmentation network. We can see that our refined data set leads to significant gains in a number of object classes. In conclusion, we propose a new framework to learn semantic boundaries from noisy annotations. Furthermore, our framework can be used to refine coarsely annotated segmentation data sets, leading to performance gains on this task. We are releasing code for STL, and we are inviting the community to use our framework to refine existing segmentation data sets. For more details about our work, please come to our poster number 156, and thank you very much.
Um, I'm Zai Wei, and on behalf of my, of my collaborators from uh, UT and uh, Zhejiang, I'm here to introduce our work on uh, Pathware Invariance Map Network. Suppose you want to compute map between two objects using a software downloaded from the internet, but it only gives you a suboptimal map due to the dissimilarity between these two objects. However, with the help from additional data, namely an object whose shape sits in between the first two objects, we can easily address the issue by using the name software. Without tuning hyperparameters to compute maps between the intermediate object with the first two objects and compose them. Likewise, suppose you want to build a machine translation system between two languages, but face the challenge of having very limited label data for training a successful machine. We can solve this problem by considering a mother language which has rich label data with the first two languages. We can train two machine translation networks and compose them to obtain a machine translation network between the two original languages. Abstraction-wise, we can summarize these two examples using a directed graph with three nodes, each of which represent an object or domain, and three edges, each of which represent a map or neural network. What happens is that there is a self-regularization constraint called passing variance, which essentially says that the direct map F3 should be identical to the composed map between F2 and F1. Note that there is a distinction between passing variant passing variant constraint and the well-known cycle consistency, which states that composed maps should be the identity maps. Finally, we can consider a network map where map vertices are domains of object and where map edges encode domains of object. We can define the passing variance constraint as the fact that the composed maps along all the passes that between two identical nodes are equivalent. So clearly, a challenge for enforcing the pass invariant constraint on a non-trivial map network where the number of pass pairs can be quite big. This brings us to the notion of pass invariant spaces, which is a subset of pairs where enforcing the pass invariant constraint among these pairs induces a pass invariant constraint among all pass pairs. Using the pass invariant spaces, we can effectively formulate the problem of joint learning of maps. The objective function essentially combines a supervised loss term enforced along a subset of edges and an unsupervised loss which enforces the invariance property among pass pairs in the pass invariant spaces. In particular, the second term can utilize unlabeled instances. Our main result is that we introduce an algorithm that constructs a pass invariant spaces with a polynomial size, which is the number of edges multiplied by the number of vertices. The main idea for the proof is to consider a directed graph as a direct acyclic graph of strongly connected component. More details can be found in the paper. You may wonder how about sampling pass pairs. Well, we found there are three advantages of using a pass invariant spaces. Namely, first, unless on special graphs, it is not easy to develop sampling strategies to guarantee the pass invariance property and to avoid long pass pairs. In addition, there is always a cost on implementing one pass pair. Finally, another issue is the convergency behavior of training, which is slow in the presence of long pass pairs. We have tested this approach on a network for the task of semantic segmentation with several domains, three-point cloud with different resolutions and two volumetric with different resolutions. On full data set of ScanNet, our approach achieves the same accuracy of using 30% label data when combining only 8% label data and treating the remaining as unlabeled. Our approach also outperforms Delphart low rank based approaches for the task of optimizing dense correspondence among across geometric uh, object. One interpretation is that these approaches solve some relaxed optimization problems and these problems become loose on sparse graphs. So in general, we found there are three benefits of joint learning of neural networks, including leverage additional training data using the pass invariance constraint to fuse patterns learned on the individual representations, which is particularly useful in 3D data, and also to leverage additional unlabeled data for training neural networks. Thank you.
Hi everyone. Today I would like to introduce you FilterRash, a robust and efficient point size registration algorithm. And we go, and this is joint work with Ross Tedrick. We come from CSA at MIT. So point size registration is a task of aligning two point cloud by estimating some motion parameters. And it is one of the core components for any visual computing system. Existing works on point size registration can be classified into SAP and a probabilistic algorithm. However, SAP is sensitive to noise and outliers, while probabilistic approaches tend to be much slower. So in this work, we contribute a new registration algorithm called FilterRatch, which is a robust, efficient, and general. In particular, it is as robust as typical probabilistic approaches while being several times faster than state-of-the-art SAP. The name filter right comes from filter-based correspondence. That is, the correspondence search, which is usually the bottleneck, can be formulated as a filtering problem. Naive evaluation of this filter can be slow, but we can exploit efficient approximate algorithm. For instance, the permahedral filter on the right. So how does filter-based correspondence work in practice? We first perform diagnostic tasks using outlier properties and for bunny, and compare our algorithm with two representative baselines. Our method is as robust as coherent point drift, or CPD, which is a widely used probabilistic algorithm. And it is much faster than both methods, as shown in the running time. We also use the algorithm for indoor camera localization. This task is a course and module for many visual slam and CD reconstruction pipeline. The proposed method is compared with various baselines, and at a comparable accuracy, our method is more than three times faster than the best SAP variants. It is also 30% faster than the state-of-the-art method GMM tree, although GMM tree rely on a high-end GPU. The algorithm is also tested with layered features. That is, the Euclidean distance in the feature space is trained to represent the correspondence. And the task is to register a template to the RGBD point cloud, where both point sides are colored by the layered features. Our method is more robust with respect to the occlusion and outlier in the feature space. Additionally, a particular advantage of this post estimation system is that it can be trained without any human notation. The discussion above is limited to rigid post estimation. However, objects in real world can move in a more complex way. For instance, the articulate object like the robot or general deformable object like the human are close. Our second key contribution is to parameterize this complex motion in a unified and efficient way using twist, where twist is a six vector that represents the local change of rigid transformation. So what's the benefit of twist? Let's compare with existing works on articulate objects. Our method is as efficient as rigid post estimation, while existing algorithms typically need a high-end GPU for real-time performance. Additionally, our method is, can be very easily implemented with off-the-shell rigid body simulators, while existing works typically need a customized kinematic tree, which is substantial software engineering. We test the algorithm with twist-based articulate model on a robot manipulation scenario. The proposed method achieves 50 frames per second, which is seven times faster than the baseline. We also implement the filter rate with twist-based deformable mode on GPU and use it as a non-rigid tracker of dynamic fusion. Filter rate is more robust with respect to fast and tangential motion. Our source code is available online and see you at the poster session.
We have time for questions. Question for speaker number one. How does your method compare with the deep learning methods? Uh, in our case, we are also a deep learning method somehow. It's just that we are optimizing the bone that is at the same time that we are doing training. But everything is going through a neural net. I also heard you were using the level sets. Yes, we are using, basically learning now is reframed as a two-step optimization. In the first one, we optimize the curve, which is kind of adjusting to the boundaries. And during the second step is basically doing back propagation and learning the parameter of the network. Thank you. Okay. I actually have a question for you, uh, David. Um, so now, finally, we can lose the label contours. That's great. But how loosely we can go? What's the uh, limit? Yeah, that's a good question. I think that that's something that we should further explore. Like, we were trying here, like with the with the SBD data set, which in our case we consider like really noisy. But how loosely can we go? Is it still something that we should like measure properly? Okay, great. Um, and for uh, for Tsai, with the Apache invariant map networks. Um, I'm just curious. I mean, this is great that uh, you, you explored the, uh, path, the path in, uh, invariance for, um, uh, for directed graph. So what if you um, convert the directed graph to an um, undirected graph by uh, inverting the network uh, so that you can basically reduce this uh, problem to the previous problem and you can just you know, solve, right? What, what, how about you compare with such a system? Well, there are a lot of networks we cannot do that comparison. Uh, for example, a lot of uh, graphs, they are not, a lot of networks, they are not invertible. If you, from image domain to cost label domain, like the problem is not invertible. So uh, we think that uh, we need to solve this problem for from directed graphs. Okay. And I have a question uh, for the uh, third uh, way, uh, the future. Um, so, um, so I, I read your paper, you are saying that it seems that the key difference between uh, the coherent point uh, drift and your approach is that you're able to do Gaussian mixture models just once for all, and they have to do like Gaussian mixture models for, for every uh, model. So um, can you actually extend it even more that you, if you just do a space quantization in a 3D space, would that be similar to Gaussian mixture models? Because um, then you, just, you can just completely throw away Gaussian mixture models. Uh, yes, there is many methods that you can discretize the 3D space and uh, make an uh, efficient uh, query algorithm. And uh, we propose uh, one using the filtering approach based on a uh, different formulation. But there do exist uh, tons of existing works, and uh, maybe all of them has its own advantage or suitable use cases. Okay. Yes. Okay. All right. Let's thank the speakers again. So, hi everyone, this is Tolga, and I will present our joint work with my friend Umut on synchronizing multi-view matches. So, given a shape collection or image collection, many computer vision applications begin by establishing pairwise matches. And correspondences computed in this way are subject to noise and inconsistency when multiple of those are matched together. Exploiting the loop closures in such multi-view scenario, our goal is then to correct or improve these matches such that the resulting correspondences are cycle consistent. Moreover, we would like to provide uncertainty or confidence information for the solutions we compute. While this problem can be, can be solved with many previous methods, none of those can yield an estimate of an uncertainty. So the main idea is we assume that the pairwise correspondences can be encoded into total permutation matrices. In this work, we do not address the case of partiality. Um, given PIJ, the observed relative permutations, we minimize what is called the cycle consistency loss over the entire hypergraph to compute the absolute permutations that reorder the points to a canonical configuration, ensuring global agreement. So as the minimization is done in the permutation space, we have a discrete optimization problem. This is hard to tackle. So like many, we relax the problem in the, the, the parameter space to the convex hull of permutations, the Birkhoff polytop, um, and contribute as follows. Um, we are, for the first time, using Riemannian optimization techniques on the relaxed parameter space, this Birkhoff polytop. And we are also the first to provide reliable confidence estimates for this problem. 
So now I would like to take a look at the geometry of the parameters. So I will make use, explicit use of this. Binary permutation matrices constitute discrete vertices of a convex simplex. So, um, and this denotes the set of matrices whose elements sum to a, a fixed number. Permutations also belong to what is called the orthogonal group. Um, and the Birkhoff polytope, encapsulated within the simplex and the orthogonal group, is the convex hull of permutation matrices. It's the manifold of double stochastic matrices whose row and column sums equate to one. These objects share the common center of mass. We will also speak of the tangent space of the Birkhoff polytope in the context of Riemannian geometry. It is only recently that Doig et al. endowed the Birkhoff polytope with a Riemannian structure, and we will use these operators to tackle the optimization problems that we have. So, here's how we solve the aforementioned tasks. We first relax, relax the parameters to live on the Birkhoff polytope, matrices whose row sums and column sums are one. We then solve the same optimization problem, but this time on the new manifold. So thanks to the Riemannian methods, we can now omit all the projected algorithms and use unconstrained minimization schemes such as Riemannian limited memory uh, LBFGs, LBFGs. So next, we char characterize the full posterior distribution by drawing samples on it and use these samples in un uncertainty or confidence estimation. To draw samples on the Birkhoff polytope using MCMC methods, for instance, we propose a new algorithm uh, and that is called Birkhoff Riemannian Langevin Monte Carlo. So here is how this would work. Consider the typical Riemannian gradient descent, in which we first compute the Euclidean gradient and, uh, and project it um, onto the tangent space of the current iterate to get the Riemannian gradient. And we use this vector to retract the current point to obtain the, next, the iterate in the next time step. And we show that using Langevin stochastic dynamics, this algorithm can simply be converted to a sampler by adding a Brownian motion term on the Euclidean gradient. This is a first order scheme, which we will call retraction Euler integrator. So our minimization scheme yields high quality outputs that outperform the state of the art in general. In this example, the red lines denote wrong matches and the blue the correct ones. It is visually apparent that we can improve upon the initial guess that is computed by, for instance, a simple Hungarian matching. Right. And we finally show uncertainty estimates here. For clarity, we pick examples where our solution is not, a particu is not particularly good. We show in column C the estimated correspondence matrix, which would ideally be identity. And note that if we instead allow top two confident matches to survive, so for instance in column E, the resulting match matrix becomes diagonally dominant, showing that we can correct confusions by the samples we draw. The rightmost column shows the cor corrected matches with confidences colorized. So I will pause for a moment here for you to look. OK, thank you. And uh, I can see you maybe at poster 159. Hello, everyone. Um, I'm Thomas Mollenhoff from the Technical University of Munich. And today I would like to talk about convex relaxations for vectorial variational problems. So here's an energy E over maps F, which map from X to Y. And we assume that X and Y are bounded open subsets of Euclidean space. And we refer to little n as the dimension of the problem and capital N as the co-dimension of the problem. Notice also the similarity to the Monge problem in optimal transport. The difference is that we now can penalize also the Jacobian of the map F which can be used to uh, ensure spatial regularity in the solution. Yes, so many tasks can be approached by minimizing such an energy, often subject to further constraints. And in this work, we are interested in finding the global minimum of this energy in the setting of co-dimension and dimension larger than one. To do so, we unify and extend a long series of works on continuous convex relaxations. So the underlying geometric idea is to search for an anisotropic minimal surface in the product space X times Y. Over a related previous work, we can tackle the setting of dimension and co-dimension larger than one without making restrictive assumptions on the set Y. We can also impose bijectivity on the solution F, and this allows us to handle also symmetrized energies, which um, depend on the function F and also the inverse of the function F. We can handle very general choices of the cost C, which can be non-convex in the first two arguments and polyconvex in the last one. 
So the main idea is to reformulate the original problem as a shape optimization problem in the product space. The key insight is that the graph of the function is an oriented smooth manifold in the product space. And at each point, um, there's the tangent space is spanned by a simple multivector. In our theoretical contribution, we show that the original energy can be reparametrized as an integral over the graph of the function with respect to a convex and one homogeneous functional acting on multivectors which span the tangent space. However, the search space over n-dimensional oriented surfaces is non-convex, so we have to relax to a larger search space. This larger search space is given by currents from the field of geometric measure theory. So every oriented n-dimensional manifold introduces a current. And essential operators on current are push-forward operators and the boundary operators, which are illustrated here above in the images. The nice thing about currents is that they form a vector space, given as the dual space to differential forms. So here's the proposed convex formulation. We minimize over n-dimensional currents in n plus large n-dimensional product space. The cost is chosen in such a way that if the current concentrates on the graph of the function, we coincide with the original energy. We add further linear constraints, which include currents, which don't correspond to uh, surfaces that are closed or surfaces which are not the graph of a function or the graph of an invertible function. Notice also the similarity to the Kantorovich relaxation in optimal transport. So to discretize this infinite dimensional problem, we approximate the product space with cubes. And then currents and differential forms are simply chains and co-chains on this cubical complex. So what that means is that zero currents are just numbers on the vertices, one currents are numbers on the edges, and so on. The boundary operator and the push-forward operators can be represented as matrices. And crucial to, to our formulation is the Whitney map, which generalizes certain finite element spaces on differential forms. So as a first example, we solved the Brachistochron, one of the earliest variational problems. This problem was already solved in closed form by Bernoulli, amongst others, and the analytical solution is shown in orange. The black vector field is the current obtained by our numerical solution, and we can see that it concentrates near the analytical solution. If we take the center of mass of the current, we can see that we get very close to the analytical solution. Notice that discrete Markov random field or integer linear programming approaches would be restricted to the vertices or the edges of this rather coarse grid. The method also generalizes a recent sublabel accurate labeling approaches and uh, yields improved isotropy over common finite, dis finite difference discretizations used in literature. As a final example of dimension and co-dimension larger than two, we consider the shape registration problem between two shapes with boundary. The product space is discretized into four-dimensional hypercubes. Solving an optimal transport problem um, yields a bijective map between the two shapes, but it is not spatially smooth. With the proposed relaxation, we can get a smooth and bijective map between the two shapes. Thank you very much. Looking forward to discuss with you at the poster. But if it, there's a problem, I, I can summarize what I did. Okay. Uh, okay. You Thank you. <laughs> okay. Uh, so now I, I assume that you know Adam is a widely used solver for for the general minimization problem, but theoretically uh, it has divergence issue that can be uh, demonstrated by count examples, and uh, so in this work we uh, modify the original atom to generic atom. So basically what we did is that uh, we are now the exponential moving average parameter in atom to, to vary in each uh, iteration step. Okay, so here is a parameter theta t here. And this generic atom can also uh, cover the adograd or even adograd EMA. Um, if you take this parameter not a constant, but say one minus one over t. And we can also uh, equivalently reformulate the generic atom into a non-algorithm, which we call weighted add EMA. Uh, this is a natural generalization of the adograd. Um, the original adograd correspond to weighted add EMA with exponentially growing weights. We have a parameter weight in the 
this uh, method. Okay. And then we developed um, a sufficient condition for this generic atom, which you can check directly by hand uh, if you fix a parameter. Um, and this uh, condition, sufficient condition, is sharp enough to cover uh, many known results, many uh, of atom type methods. For example, as I mentioned, added EMA and uh, atom NC and a couple of others, okay. And if you take a specific family of parameters, you can even write out the convergence rates explicitly. Then we'll come back to the case that you take theta t to be constant, namely the original uh, atom. First of all, in this case, the bound we do NEPT, in this case is capital O1. Okay, so it means that there's no convergence guarantee. Um, second, we can show that over a continuous uh, path of parameters that it connects the add EMA and the original atom. Oh, uh, okay, but I'm ahead of that story. Um, you will find that the conver convergence rates uh, continuously change from capital O log T over radical T, so um, the best um, convergence rate to capital O1, namely no convergence guarantee. And from the perspective of weighted at EMA, we show that weighted at EMA converges for polynomially growing widths, but not for exponentially growing widths. Uh, remember that with exponentially growing widths, that's the original ad atom, okay. And we did experiment on the synthesis contact example um, to verify the theory over the continuous path. And the result exactly based on the theoretical result. Okay, that's it. Okay. Um, so I will not jump uh, into the details of the um, experiment because it will take a lot of time. But just to summarize uh, the work in one sentence, we propose a sufficient condition for convergence of generic atom, and we use it to investigate the divergence issue of atom. And if you want to know more, please uh, visit us at our poster number 161. Thank you. Any questions? Anyone? Please. I can ask one. Oh, sorry. Am I allowed to ask a question? Please. Oh, sure. <laughs> Go for it. Cool. So I was wondering, um, your your formulation is some kind of this uh, relationship to optimal transport, and there are many regularization methods for the optimal transport. It seems like you also. You, actually, you are also regularizing the optimal transport a bit. Um, did you find any connection to the current regularizations and your regularization? Um, so the connection to optimal transport is um, the setting when we kind of don't penalize the Jacobian of the function. Then it can be shown that our relaxation just specializes to optimal transport. And I'm not aware of any existing works in optimal transports which can do this kind of regularization. So, um, I mean, there's a, there's a different way of uh, including spatial regularity in these kind of matching problems, which are these chroma of Wasserstein distances, but these lead to these quadratic assignment problems, while our formulation um, leads to a, a convex prob problem. Um, Thank you. So um, what's the numeric methods that you use to optimize um, your convex optimization problem and, and what's the convergence speed? Is it very expensive? Um, yeah, that's the drawback of this method that um, I use the primal dual algorithm of Pock and Chambol, 
and this converges sublinearly. So the kind of um, theoretical convergence guarantee is one over epsilon. If you want an epsilon accurate solution, you need one over epsilon iterations. Um, but in practice, this algorithm can be uh, put on a GPU and then it runs fast anyways, even though the theoretical convergence rate is uh, very slow, like exponentially slow. Any other questions? How are we on time, by the way? We're good? Okay, if not, well, uh, actually I have a short announcement, uh, just a request. Uh, it would be great if you could stay on your seats in the last Q&A. That would be great. Thank you. Well, let's thank the speakers once more. Hello everyone, my name is Jun. Uh, our team comes from Riken, Japan. The goal of our team is to use the Notion Tensor to solve problems in both machine learning and scientific computing. And in this work, we propose a more general framework for low rank metrics completion that imposes the linear transformation of the data into the model and the low rank structure of the transformed data would be considered in the completion. So, I would like to start with a very basic concept of the matrix completion. So matrix completion is the task of fading the missing entries of a partially observed matrix. So one commonly known example of the move is the movie rating matrix, in which each entry represents the rating of the movie by a user if he has watched that, and is otherwise missing. And the goal is simply to predict the remaining entries. But unlike the gun-based method, which provides some realistic results, the advantage of matrix completion is the theoretical guarantees of the performance to the true results. And of course, the key assumption of the matrix completion is the low rank structure of the date. Although this assumption is generally applicable to real-world data, however, in some cases, the low rankness of the present date is not sufficient, uh, thus many tricks have been introduced. Uh, here, I would like to present you a work commonly employing the tricks to the Im image restoration task, namely the non-local method. Uh, for example, in the hyperspectral image restoration task, we first crop patches with similar uh, appearances from the orange images. Uh, then we do unfolding and concatenating to let the patches form a matrix with low rank structures. Finally, we can use any well-designed low rank matrix completion method to perform the restorations. So in this case, it is obviously that the cropping, unfolding, and the concatenating operations can be represented can be represented as linear transformations. To summarize this, I will say a significant low rank structure appears under some linear transformations. Even the original data may be not low rank. Now here address the problems. Although this method works well in practice, the conventional theoretical analysis for guarantee is no longer suitable since the low rankness assumption is based on the original data. Thus, we need to build theoretical guarantees concerning the transformations. So we first propose a generalization of the matrix completion problem, which we call matrix completion under multiply linear transformations. So the formulation of MCMT is similar to conventional uh, matrix completion, where the x, y is the target matrix and uh, its observations. The p omega is the sampling projections. And here we add the qi terms to denote the linear transformations. So note that since the QI is the linear transformations between two matrices, so it could be represented as a fourth order tensors. And also we can use unfold to, we can also unfold it to two matrices. So here is the main result of our work. In this theorem, we present a deterministic upper bound of the reconstruction error in terms of the tuning parameters, the size of matrix, and the number of linear transformations and their singular values. Also, the word deterministic means that there is no probabilistic assumption. 
So from this theorem, we know that firstly, the reconstruction error has upper bound as long as the tuning parameter lambda, which controls the balance between the Fabian's norm and the low rankness, is sufficiently large than a value with regard to the strength of the noise. So on the other hand, of course, a too large lambda will result in loose bound. More interestingly, the bound has strong relationships with the singular values of QIs, and the singularity of QIs is reflected by the conditional number of the transformations. So at last, we would, do break, we would like to briefly demonstrate the effectiveness of the new MCMT model by completing the simple linear image. So here is the observed linear. Uh, has many missing rows and clumps. And here we employ the differential operators, which of course can be represented by linear transformations on the observed date. And you can see that our method clearly outperformed other metric complaint measured methods. Thank you for your attention. You can further discuss with us in post 162. Hello, I'm Paul Soboda, and I'll talk about uh, map inference via block cornered Frank Wolf algorithm. This is joint work with Vladimir Kolmogorov from the Institute for Science and Technology, Austria. So, um, in this work, we are interested in energy minimization, and uh, we phrase it as minimization of a function f, uh, with, where its arguments are uh, binary vectors of d dimensions. Um, this is, in general, an NP-hard problem for which no polynomial time algorithm is known. However, often in computer vision, we know uh, good decompositions into individual functions, where the sum forms the, uh, the total function that we want to minimize. We, we utilize that decomposition to go into the dual domain and introduce Lagrange multipliers to get um, dual low bounds. And the problem becomes easier because we just have to um, optimize perturbed versions of the individual functions. Um, and when we can find Lagrangian multipliers so that each um, optimizer of each subfunction agrees with each other, we know that we have uh, found the uh, primal solution. Also, from uh, a theoretical perspective, this is a much nicer formulation because um, it's a concave uh, maximization problem and every local uh, Optima is a global one. If we assume that each uh, individual subterm is easily solvable, this becomes algorithmically tractable because then we can um, compute subgradients of that uh, concave maximization problem and optimize it uh, globally. However, still the uh, problem is non smooth, and for example, Frank Wolfe cannot be applied in that setting. To alleviate that, we again change the function um, to make it smooth. For that, uh, we introduce a proximal term. Um, and um, this makes the prob uh, problem strongly concave. If we dualize again, it becomes a smooth problem to which Frank Wolfe is applicable. However, now the um, uh, uh, optima of the prox uh, dual step and the uh, dual optima do not coincide anymore. The proximal step restricts the optimum to be near the prox and the lambda zero. To find the um, best dual uh, Lagrange uh, variables, hence we ha have to solve a um, series of uh, proximal dual steps. This is the proximal step algorithm. We start with any um, Lagrange multipliers, and we set the next Lagrange multipliers to be the output of the proximal dual step, the next, Lagrange, uh, the next proximal uh, center to be the output of the proximal step. And this eventually converges to the uh, dual uh, optimum. So now we have to solve a, a series of proximal dual steps, and we need to uh, do that efficiently for the algorithm to be fast. Uh, we propose a bundle method where we collect subgradients which form a local approximation to the function that we want to optimize. And one subgradient is a linear approximation, and if we collect more and more subgradients, then the maximum of, of them uh, gives us a better and better local approximation. And our method alternates between uh, evaluating more subgradients and um, optimizing the local approximation that is given by, by the maximum of the sample subgradients. We propose to solve the proc steps um, and collect the subgradients and optimize them with a multiplane block cornered Frank Wolf method. Uh, we efficiently use the problem decomposition into, into the sum to efficiently solve subgradients. 
and we apply our problem to um, maximum upper story inference in Markov random fields uh, for solving graph matching and discrete tomography. Interestingly, we outperform state-of-the-art bundle solvers uh, proposed by the operations research community and which are um, very intricate uh, uh, numerical optimization schemes. Um, our code is available online on GitHub. If you have any problem, uh, any, any optimization problem where you have access to subgradients, you might interface it with our code and, and see whether that uh, will improve your uh, performance. So we have tested it on a challenging MRF experiment from uh, biology where efficient message passing algorithms get stuck in suboptimal local plans. And for example, the Koenig bundle uh, scheme, which is a state-of-the-art uh, solver, is significantly slower uh, than ours, which uh, surpasses message passing um, after, uh, after a short while. Um, another problem is um, graph matching, where basically uh, the same image holds. Here, message passing gets stuck in an even worse uh, solution. And discrete tomography, where uh, message passing is not applicable anymore. Um, thank you very much. All right, hello everybody. I'm still Paul Soboda, and I'll talk about a convex relaxation for multigraph matching. This is joint work with Dagmar Keinmüller and Ashkan Mokarian from the Berlin Institute of Health and Max Delbrück Center in Germany, and uh, with Christian Theobald and Florian Bernard from uh, Max Planck Institute and Saarland University in both in Germany. So let me first review the classical graph matching problem. Uh, it is about uh, matching nodes of uh, two graphs to each other. Um, and we phrase it in terms of a matching matrix X, such that uh, the ij entry of X is one, if and only if uh, node i is matched to node j uh, in the respective two graphs. It can be formulated uh, mathematically as um, by the constraints that each row and each uh, column of X uh, sum to one. And uh, we allow for quadratic costs to capture geometric relationships. For example, in that case, in that example, um, short edges are matched to short edges, and uh, long edges are matched to long edges. Now, uh, the graph matching problem can be um, generalized to more than two graphs. This, then, is the multigraph matching setting. Here, if we introduce a third graph, um, but we can do more, then we have a quadratic number of matches between each pair of graphs, and we can, we can phrase it as, as a collection of graph matching problems, but the notion of cycle consistency arises. For example, if, if we look at node three in graph A, it's matched to node three in graph B, which again, in turn, is matched to node three in graph C, and that is matched to back to node three in graph A. So this is a cycle consistent match. But if we start at node one in graph A, we can follow to node two in graph B, to node two in graph C, and again, we come back to graph A, but we end with node two. This is not a cycle consistent solution, and um, we want to correct that. This is done via cycle consistency constraints. Um, the rationale behind that is uh, that spurious matches between individual uh, graph matchings can be corrected by, uh, by looking at, um, uh, at other matches via some uh, cycles. And by um, optimizing all the graph matchings together and linking them via cycle consistency, we can possibly attain um, better solutions. So this is a very hard uh, optimization problem, and previous work was not fully satisfactory. So not all natively allow for partial matchings, not all allow for quadratic costs. We um, support both. We even support higher order costs based on uh, higher order information. Uh, crucially, our optimization is not based on uh, primal heuristics that may or may not lead to good solutions. We, um, we investigate a linear programming formulation which allows us to uh, write, uh, to, to devise very efficient message passing algorithms that output lower bounds and optimality gaps. Also, uh, scalability is an issue in previous work. Um, wh whenever uh, the solvers could optimize a uh, more expressive model with quadratic cost, for example, the solver would not scale very well, whereas um, we scale linearly in the size of the problem. Our code is available uh, on GitHub as well. Um, yeah, you can, there's also a plain graph matching solver. All right, um, so we tested our graph matching on, uh, on a few standard benchmark data sets. 
Um, For example, on the CMU hotel, oh no, that, that was too fast. Right, on the CMU hotel and house, and we see that, that our principled approach uh, outperforms um, previous work in, uh, with regards to precision and recall. Um, there is also, some, on some synthetic data sets, the image looks uh, similar. But most crucially, um, we have investigated a very large scale problem from uh, biology, where we want to match uh, cell nuclei of uh, some model organism. And interestingly, if we add more and more um, organisms, the precision really goes up significantly and the recall as well. But um, the, the problems become huge. So for example, if we have 10 organisms, then, then our optimization problem uh, has 36 million variables. And there was no uh, multigraph matching solver which could handle quality cost, which we need for geometric consistency, and those uh, lots of organisms that we need for, for a good precision. Our solver uh, fulfilled all the um, requirements of, of that optimization problem. Thank you very much. We have time for questions. OK. Um, I have questions for, uh, for Paul. Um, so it's, it's very nice work. Um, for, the, uh, for, the, for your first work, for the MAP inference, so you, um, you, know, you, you, you formulate the problem as um, a proximal um, a dual problem, and you said that the algorithm, the lambda, starts from zero, and yep. you have a iterative algorithm. I'm just curious, how would the lambda value change, right? So would you actually come down to zero as it converges? Or okay. you would just converge to a, a, a value? So um, it depends on, uh, on the strength of the proximal term. So if you have a very strong proximal term, um, the lambda will change very slowly. Right, but each individual uh, problem will, will be solved very fast because you, you essentially add a very large smoothing. And if you add a small uh, proximal term only, or uh, scale down the proximal term, then each of your proximal uh, dual uh, step is uh, harder to compute, but you make larger progress um, towards, the, um, towards the global uh, dual optimum. So uh, the convergence and, and the behavior of the, that is, uh, is dependent on a tuning parameter. And, and one wants to have a good uh, compromise between uh, solving, solving each subproblem fast and making good progress uh, in, after one proximal step. OK, that's cool. Um, for your um, second work, so I'm just curious, right? Is, is your contribution about uh, formulating the, uh, the, graph, the matching problem as adding uh, cycle consistency, or is it about you formulate it as a, a, a linear programming and use like, message passing to solve this massive problem? Um, well, there is, I would say there is a minor contribution with regards to the formulation because um, I think cycle consistency has not been investigated with partial matchings, but th th that's not so important. I think the, the main contribution is the formulation as a linear programming formulation, and this has not been done before, and, and, and that allows us to really devise um, principled uh, algorithms that, that solve the LP instead of just, just having a heuristic. Yeah. Great, great, got it, thank you. Um, and for June, I have a question. Oh. There's a question. Yeah, so I have one question for the third work. So there are a lot of uh, non-convex techniques for solving uh, convex programs for solving multigraph matching. Can you comment on the comparisons? Non-convex. Yeah. Um, OK, so there is, there is different families of non-convex uh, approaches to that. For example, um, some people do it as, as a two-step uh, Thing where, where they add a permutation synchronization step on, on, some, um, on some pairwise matchings that they have obtained, and they solve it uh, with, with some non-convex uh, scheme, like um, the previous presenters did with the, on, on, with the optimization on the Birkhoff polytope. Um, and, and for example, the problem with that approach is that um, it's not so much non-convexity, but um, it is that, that it's a post-processing step. So, so the synchronization is not done at the same time as, as the optimization. So, so people usually lose some, uh, some optimality via that process processing. I would say that, that, is, that is the bigger issue. No. Okay. Um, I have one last question for Jun. Um, so um, I'm just curious. I think uh, you know, uh, matrix factorization is great. So have you compared with like a deep learning methods? 
right? Like training on many images to do this, uh, you know, filling on. Yes, but deep learning method doesn't guarantee the result will be true. For example, in some medical images, uh, deep learning based method could uh, aid some, something that looks very realistic, but it doesn't guarantee the completed images will be, I mean, true. Indeed. But do you have guarantees from uh, matrix factorization? Yeah, but if it is low rank, we can have some uh, bound for the... But low rank can, can, imply, can, can imply smoothness, yeah. for example. Yeah, mm, yes. Okay. All right. So that uh, concludes. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank, thank you, you for the, to those two speakers. And thank you for all the speakers. And this concludes the afternoon session of uh, uh, this oral session. Thank you.